My name is Kayvan Rahimian. I was born in 1965 in Tehran, the capital of my dear country, Iran. They called me from the court today. I had to go to prison. My daughter, Gina, had been listening to my phone conversation. She asked me, who was it? When I told her that I had to go to prison, she started to cry. Why do you have to go? Why does our family have to suffer again? Why don't you just escape? I didn't know what to say. I just held her hand and stroked her hair while she pressed her head against my chest and continued to cry. Baha'is are a religious minority in Iran. The Baha'i faith originated in Iran, but it now has more than 7 million followers in 218 countries and territories around the world. Baha'is believe in non-violence, equality of men and women, and universal compulsory education. Unlike Muslims, Baha'is don't believe that the Prophet Muhammad was the last messenger of God. They follow the teachings of Baha'u'llah, who founded the religion in 1863. Since then, many Muslim Iranians have called the Baha'is enemies of God and have persecuted them. Since the Islamic Revolution in 1979, Baha'is have become second-class citizens in Iran. They have been persecuted by their government and have been denied of basic rights such as education and employment. It is almost impossible to cover the lives of the Baha'is in Iran. Persecution in their own country has forced thousands of Baha'is to migrate to different parts of the world. Kayvan Rahimian's uncle and cousin live in the United States, home to the largest Iranian Baha'i diaspora. Every person at this gathering has lost a friend or a family member since the 1979 revolution. Kayvon's father, Rahim, was arrested on the 4th of May, 1983, at around 7.30 p.m. از کمیته ها به منزل کسی می رفت اگر کسی تلفن می زد به اون منزل می گفتن مهمان داریم و من چون زنگ زده بودم و ایشون گفت مهمان داریم من متوجه بودم که ایشون گرفتار خواهد شد رحیم was a businessman in Tehran In the early 1970s Rahim planned to start a new life in India but his two sons insisted on staying in Iran Kayvan and his younger brother Kamran didn't want to be away from their friends and relatives. After the revolution, Rahim helped the persecuted Baha'is by finding them safe houses. At the time of his father's arrest, Kayvan was 16. Years later, Kayvan wrote about it in a letter to his own daughter. I was studying algebra when the bell rang and four men raided our house. One of them brought his right fist to my chin and asked me, where is the Baha'i National Assembly's stamp? Are you going to tell me or should I smash your face? My knees were trembling with fear. I told him that I didn't know. My father immediately rushed into the room and said, don't touch him. If you have any questions, ask me. After his arrest, Rahim was taken to an unknown location. 
که یادم میاد سختی پسر اموان بود که در سن خودم بودن و علاقه و وابستگی که به پدر داشتم در اون سن و بدونی که در یک روز پدر تو میبرن و بعد از چند وقت از خونه اتاق تخت خوابت وسایل شخصیت بی دلیل باید بذاری و بری بیرون اون برای من خیلی سخت بود After days of searching for him Rahim's family found out that he was sent to Evin prison where hundreds of Baha'is and thousands of other prisoners had been tortured and executed. In a letter smuggled out of the prison, a Baha'i prisoner described what Rahim had to endure. Once again, they tied Mr. Rahimian to the bench and severely tortured him. After whipping and beating him savagely, they threw him by me in the hallway. It's impossible to describe his condition he could hardly breathe, and until the day he was released, he still had difficulty breathing. His size could melt any heart with a shred of humanity in it, and his feet were bloody and swollen. He was in such pain that a convulsion shook all his body. خانواده رحیم، خانواده عموم، آفاق، کامران و کیوان اصلا براش مهم نبود. بر ما به مراتب سختتر بود. بر ما به مراتب این عمل باور نکردنی بود ولی اینا به ما دلداری می دادن و اینا به ما لبخند می زدن و اینا به ما می گفتن که افتخار می کنیم به رحیم پدرمون این خیلی سخت بود من یادم ما فقط در ظرف یک سال که برادرم زندان بود پنج بار فقط تونستیم ایشون رو ببینیم و دست شکسته کتش تا نزدیک آرنجش آویزون بود و دندون ها شکسته بود حالا این از شخص ایشون ولی من مادر پیرم رو هر دو چهار شنبه ای که میتونستیم هر 15 روز بریم شما باور نمی کنیم من هر شب چهار شنبه که میخواستم بخوابم آرزوی مرگ می کردم که زنده نباشم و مادرم رو ببرم مادر من پیر 80 ساله با روسری و چادر خیلی ناراحت بود برای پسرش خیلی دوست می داشت و رحیم هم مادر رو خیلی دوست می داشت گاه اوقات این روسری یا چادرش می رفت عقب از اون داد میزد که میبخشیم پیر سگ چادر تو حجابت رعایت کن و این کارها بسیار بسیار تکرار شد و من خیلی افسرده شده بود. The Islamic government routinely staged show trials in Evin prison and forced the prisoners to recant their ideas on television. Rahim was also under pressure to make a televised confession. But Baha'i teachings forbid the followers of the faith to renounce their religion, even to save their lives. دو نفر در دو موقعیت مختلف برای من تعریف کردند که به قدری به پاهای رحیم کابل زده بودند که هر دو پاش خون می آمده و راه رفتن براش بسیار بسیار سخت بوده بار دومی که ملاقات شد ایشون به من اشاره کرد که من رو با دستش به گلوی خودش اشاره کرد و من متوجه شدم که ایشون رو خواهند کشت Kayvon was with his uncle in that last meeting in Evin. It was the 30th of September, 1983. With a hand gesture, my father told us that he was going to be executed. He had lost so much weight that his jacket looked too big on him. We didn't say a word when we said goodbye. We just hugged each other as strongly as we could. 
I didn't know that it was the last time that I was going to see him. Rahim was executed shortly after, but his family was notified of the death weeks later. On the 1st of March, 1984, I was at my uncle's house. The phone rang. It was my mother. She said that the government official had told her that my father didn't compare to Islam, so he was executed. My mother asked me to give the news to my younger brother, Kamran. I was choked with emotion. I started to cry. The Islamic revolutionaries had penetrated the Baha'i community before the revolution. The revolutionaries had a list of influential Baha'is who were generally among the most educated and successful Iranians. Mona Mahmoudi's father, Hushang, a famous television personality, was among the nine leaders of Iran's Baha'is, who were in charge of the administrative affairs of the community. In 1980, Mona was living in the United States. من هر وقته با پدر مادر صحبت می کردم البته خوب مواظب خودتون باشین البته می دونید مادر من وقتی بهشون می گفتم گفتن که ما همیشه مواظب هستیم چون واقعا دلشون نمی خواست گرفتار بشن اونا دلشون می خواست زنده بمونن و خدمت بکنن به این جامعه ایران ولی خوب می دونستن که به هر حال گرفته می شن و گرفتار می شن On the morning of the 21st of August, 1980, more than a year after the Islamic government came to power, Mona's mother called her from Iran. She told Mona that her father and all other members of the Baha'i National Assembly had been kidnapped. <laughs> بله من اتفاقا منزل پدر بزرگی پسرم بودم در کالیفرنیا من اتفاقا پسرم تقریبا 6 ماهش بود 6 هفتهش بود اون موقع تازه از دکتر برگشته بودم از شات اولش زده بودن نمیدونم چه چه موقعی هستش که دو ماهش بود در حقیقت بله و تو اتاق نشسته اتاق مهمانخونه‌اش بود نشسته بودیم که تلفن زنگ میزنه و میگن که بله این عزیزان رو بودن و معلوم نیست به جای نامعلومی بردنشون و بلافاصله بعد از اون مادرم با ما تماس گرفتن و گفتن که بله پدر رفتن و ایشون رو بردن و, و ما دنبالشون هستیم ولی هیچ فکر نمی کنیم که ازشون اثری پیدا بشه ولی ما به هر ما دنبالشون هستیم Mona never saw her father again and no one has ever claimed responsibility for the abduction of the Baha'i leaders تنها چیزی که من همیشه راجبش دعا می کردم موقعی که پدر رو گرفته بودن این هستش که هر جا که هستن زودتر ترتیب کار داده بشه که در حقیقت زج و شکنجه نبینن ولی راحت الان آروم آروم هستم Following the kidnapping of the first assembly members in 1980 Iran's Baha'is chose nine new leaders including Mona's mother, Jinus, a prominent meteorologist. On the 13th of December, 1981, Jinus and seven other Baha'i leaders were arrested. They were all sentenced to execution and killed two weeks later. <laughs> از آدمایی بودیم که فکر میکنم خیلی لاکی بودیم خوش شانس بودیم که میدونستیم که اقلا پدر مادر هدفشون چی هست و واقعا اون کاری که پدر مادر دوست داشتن داشتن میکردن در ایران چون اونا موقعیت داشتن از ایران بیان بیرون ولی نمیخواستن از ایران بیان بیرون نادرشون میخواست زنده بمونن و خدمت بکنن به این جامعه ایران ما اصولا یه جامعه صلح طلب هستیم و اصلا باورمون نمیشه که یک همچین موازی برای این جامعه یا افراد اون جامعه پیش بیاد چون اصلا چون تو عوالم سیاست هم نیستی وقتی همچین چیزایی برای هر کی پیش میاد چون تجربه نداریم از قبل که اگر اینطوری شد ما چه بکنیم برای شروع ما خیلی بیشتر ضربه میخوردیم تا اینکه 
راه پیدا بکنیم که چه جوری خودمون آرام بکنیم چون در مقابل حکومت واقعا نمیتونستیم کاری بکنیم Within five years after the Islamic Revolution, more than 200 Baha'is were executed. Among them, farmers, university students, business leaders, and physicians. Some of the victims were brutalized, even after death. After Dr. Masi Farhangi was executed, his family knew that he had been separated from the Muslim bodies. But it was only later in the morgue that they discovered his desecrated body. جمهوری اصلا فکر نمی کرد که با کشتن محفل ملی ایران خیلی موضوع مهمیه به کشته این گروه رو دیگه اصلا جامعه حیات داشته باشه اصلا همچه فکر رو نمی کرد بعد دید ای وای محفل دوم اومد و سر دوباره برداشت کفش اینا رو تصورش این نبود که با نبودن محافل جامعه سر پا باشه the dominant iteration of Shiism in Iran simply says if you are born a Muslim, then you cannot leave the faith. And if you do, then there's something wrong with you. It's very much like Stalinist Russia. Life is good. If you're critical of the regime, you must be mad. They more or less have the same mad logic in terms of Baha'is. The brutal persecution of the Baha'is in modern Iran is difficult to understand. But it originated in the 19th century, when Shia clerics mobilized their supporters to massacre the Baha'is across the country. The public humiliation of the Baha'is was initiated by Shia clergy, the Mullahs. The clerics objected to the Baha'u'llah's claim that he was the latest prophet of God. In the 19th century, Baha'i prisoners were shackled and paraded publicly as a warning to the rising number of Iranian converts to the Baha'i faith. There are reports, some reports, that it went up as much as a, over a million uh, at the time of the Constitutional Revolution. So uh, remember, 1905. 1905, at the time, the population of Iran was 15 million. If the figure is right, and it's very hard to establish these figures, but it's clearly a faith that grew, uh, but it's a faith that grew in the face of a religion and a leadership that has absolutely no tolerance for uh, separation from uh, the church. The vicious attacks against the Baha'is were less frequent during the Pahlavi era. Reza Shah Pahlavi, who came to power in 1925, and his son, Muhammad Reza, the Shah, tried to emulate the ancient Persian kings by granting an equal status to all Iranians of different ethnicities and religions. The Pahlavis gave the Baha'is almost the same rights as other Iranians. The Baha'i faith wasn't recognized as a religion, but Iranian Baha'is were not persecuted. They were free to practice their faith and have their own schools. The high educational standard of some Baha'i schools made them popular with all sectors of Iranian society, especially Shia Muslims. This further angered Shia clerics who eventually forced Reza Shah to shut down Baha'i schools. The Pahlavi kings attempted to make Iran a secular society and tried to curb the mullah's powers. But most Iranians 
remained religious, and the clergy continued to be an influential force. The Shah knew that in order to remain in power, he had to appease the mullahs. In 1954, a group of vigilantes led by a mullah destroyed the main Baha'i religious center in Tehran. The royal army commanders barricaded the religious center so the crowd could destroy the building with impunity and even used pickaxes to help the anti-Baha'i mob. But despite random attacks against their communities, the Baha'is actively took part in the modernization of Iran during the time of the Shah. The Shah's relative tolerance toward the Baha'is angered many Muslim clerics. Those mullahs particularly objected to the Shah's family laws that gave equal rights to women and women's suffrage. They claimed that the Shah passed those laws under Baha'i influence. زنان و مردان حقوق مساوی دارن ولی در دیانت باهایی وقتی به تعلیم و تربیت میرسه زنان تعلیم و تربیت زنان همیشه ارجح بر آقایان تو یه مثالی زدن برای توضیح دادن بیشتر این مسئله که وقتی که یه خانواده اگر یک پسر و دختر در خانوادهش وجود دارم داره اگر مشکل مالی داره و نمیدونه کدوم رو باید به مدرسه بفرسته و اونا رو باید تحصیل بکنن باید ارجحیت به دختر اون خانواده داده بشه به خاطر این دختر هستش که بزرگ خواهد شد مادر خواهد شد و فرزندانی خواهد داشت و این مادر هست که وظیفه تعلیم و تربیت فرزندانش رو به عهده خواهد داشت Ayatollah Ruhullah Khomeini the future leader of the revolution began his campaign against the Shah in 1962. When the Shah talks about equality of men and women, it's because of the Baha'i influence. The Baha'is believe in the equality of men and women and sending women to the army. The Shah repeats the same thing. You miserable man, you shouldn't do these things. The Islamic Revolution, which toppled the Shah in February 1979, unleashed the hostility of many Shia Iranians toward the Baha'is, an enmity which had been building for generations. Ayatollah Khomeini used this revolutionary fervor to destroy the remnants of the Shah's regime and build his own version of an ideal Islamic society. Iranian officials rarely discuss their actions against the Baha'is and refuse to talk to us. But in an interview with ABC News in 1983, Iran's ambassador to the United Nations gave a rare insight into his government's actions. Do you consider Baha'is to be heretics? I think they are sacrilegious. They are heretics. What do you mean by heretics? Heretics in the sense of... It is not a, a religion. I, I told you, I consider it as a political, uh, 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 treacherous political movement, created primarily by the Russians, then supported strongly by the British, and now um, has uh, the uh, uh, strong support of uh, American media and foreign policy and uh, everything. Are they a threat to Islam? No, they are a threat to the good uh, and to uh, the welfare and happiness of, of the third world countries. Ayatollah Khomeini equated being a Baha'i with spying for Israel. Most Baha'is, killed by the Islamic government, were charged with spying for the Zionist regime. Yet the only evidence the Iranian government has ever produced is that the shrine of Baha'u'llah is near the city of Haifa in Israel, where the main Baha'i administrative body is located. But in the report that was filed by your mission to the United Nations, though, mm. it mentioned specifically that because the Baha'i World Center was in Haifa, that Israel, which you said was an anti-Islamic power, was therefore the nourishing cradle of Baha'is. There is a relation between Israel 
and Baha'ism, no doubt. We also know that the, uh, the uh, Baha'i World Center is in Haifa. We have also historical evidence which supports the strong relation between the creation of Baha'ism on the one hand and Zionism on the other hand. If you have one page in Hata Bahal, Madrak Doshta, Alehi in a day that Rahbari Jamai Bahayat in Aran Grifta and Dr. Zendan. Yek Satr Agar, Yek Sanat Agar Pedokar Dudan Tabahal, that Tamom Matwat Jahan Shunish Mida, he cheesy Pedanakardan, Tabahal Town Jake Mandidam, but Konchkab Budam Dombal Kardam, he Sanadi Dal Lebarinke. اینها کاری جز مذهب خودشون رو میخوان انجام بدن پیدا نکردن ایرانیان افیشلز نیوه منشن دات بحولا وز بریید این پالستاین ویچ وز پارت اف دا آتومن امپایر این 1892 مور دن 57 یرز بفور دی استابلشمنت اف دی ستیت اف ازرائیل تدی دی گوورمنت اف ازرائیل هز نو کنترول اوور دی بحایی افیرز ایت رگارز دی بحاییز as harmless non-political guests who generate millions of dollars in tourism revenue. Generally, among the leaders, we had a good number of them uh, who were agents of uh, America or Israel. And they were executed? Oh, yes. It, 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 it had nothing to do with uh, Baha'ism. It just happened that we had among Muslims also people who have been executed. The massacre of Iranian Baha'is led to an international outcry, especially in the United States. The tragedy of the Baha'is persecuted in Iran in the name of Islam. The Baha'is are a worldwide religious faith. In general, the Baha'is practice a gentle faith that advocates meeting violence with serenity. Sixteen members of the Baha'is that we know about were hanged. They were part of a group of 22 for whom President Reagan had pled for mercy. Bob, does our government's protest make any difference? Well, apparently not, Barbara. Another 22 Baha'is were arrested just last week. Members of the Baha'i faith say it's a question of genocide. And the alleged perpetrator of the genocide is the government of Iran, a case of religious genocide unique at this moment on this planet. We are calling on the government of Iran to stop this monstrosity lest it be condemned by the civilized world for all eternity. Even fanatical and tyrannical regimes like the Ayatollah Khomeini's have some sensitivity to world public opinion. If they're allowed to murder in the dark, the murders may never end. International pressure finally forced the Iranian government to stop the mass execution of the Baha'is in 1986. By then, the Islamic government had established itself. The Baha'is had already become second-class citizens. They were not allowed to study or teach in universities. This secret document from Iran's Supreme Council of Cultural Revolution shows that in 1991, the council recommended that individual Baha'is be allowed to live in Iran. Yet, at the same time, the government had a duty to prevent the Baha'is from prospering and progressing as a community. The Council's recommendation was accepted by Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Iran's current supreme leader, who replaced Ruhullah Khomeini in 1989. After the murder of her father, Marjan Davoudi, a university student, was called in by the dean. She was told that she was to be expelled from the university because she was a Baha'i. When I was in the house, 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 ولی شخصا یادم میاد خودم یک طوری به خودم قول دادم که از یاد گرفتن نیستم اگر یه جماعتی به وسیله حکومتی زیر فشار قرار بگیره و سرکوب بشه بهش تبعیض بکنن 
تعصب نشون بدن برای اینکه حقوقش رو پایمال بکنن اون جامعه به هر حال یه روزی قیام میکنه میخواد مشکلش رو حل بکنه In 1987, Tahereh Burgess joined a group of educated Baha'is who'd established BIHE, the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education. We can't show the faces of BIHE professors and students in this picture because all of them still live and work in Iran. Tahereh had to migrate to the United States for medical reasons. جامعه باهایی اون روزی که دید دیگه بچه ها راه به جایی ندارن و اونها رو به دانشگاه ها راه نمیدن به پا خواست. تمام افراد جامعه به اضافه افرادی که تحصیل کرده بودن در جامعه ما و بالاخره به کمک اساتیدی که به دلیل باهایی بودن از دانشگاه ها اخراج شده بودن همه ما با هم همداستان شدیم دست به دست هم دادیم و یک صدا تصمیم گرفتیم یه دانشگاه تحسیص بکنیم و این کار رو کردیم این خیلی موقع موضوع مهم می بود Soon after the start of BIHE many Baha'i houses in Iran became part of the underground university's unofficial campus BIHE's degrees had no academic value but the Baha'is of Iran embraced the idea of having a university of their own هر هفته ما ارسال داشتیم یعنی ما از هر استادی مراجعه می کردیم بهش یه مقدار تکلیف و مسائل مختلف میداد ما تیکه تیکه اینا رو برای بچه ها یعنی هر جمعه ما دور هم دیگه پنج شیش نفر بودیم جمع می شدیم از صبح می رفتیم تو خونه یکی از باهایی تو تهران و شروع می کردیم به جمع و جور کردن اینا و اینا رو پاکت کردن و همه رو ارسال کردن به اون کسایی رو که انتخاب کرده بودیم در شهرستان ها به امان نماینده وقتی ما کلاس در منازل تشکیل می شد خب منزل که جای کلاس درس نیست توی خونه اونها بچه های کوچیکم این بر اون بر بودن خود اون خانوم صاحب خونه هزار تا کار و بار زندگی داشت دیگه ولی خونه شو در یک ساعتی در اختیار بیایه چی می که ما کلاس همون رو تشکیل بدیم یا هایی می دیدیم مثلا بچه اون میاد وسط کلاس این اتفاق می افتاد اولش برای من بسیار سخت بود درس خوندن تو این مؤسسه علتش همین بود که تمام دروس دانشگاهی بود و تماما مکاتبه ای بود در کل یه سمستر پنج ماه ما فقط یک جلسه کلاس حضوری برای هر درسی داشتیم منبع کسب اطلاعاتمون علاوه بر مطالب درسی این بود که بریم توی کتاب خونه ها و کتاب خونه های دانشگاه هم آرارا نمی دادن و با خاطرم هست که با خیلی ترفند های مختلفی باید تعیین می‌کردیم وارد کتابخونه بشیم حتی بعضی وقتا دوستامون که باهایی نبودن و در دانشگاه مشغول تحصیل بودن به ما کمک می‌کردن که کتاب بگیریم یا بتونیم مطالعه بکنیم باور بفرمایید زمانی که ما شروع کردیم کار بیای چی رو پی بگیریم ما اصلا احساس می‌کردیم که با چنان تلاشی داریم کار می‌کنیم با چنان شتابی داریم جلو می‌ریم که اصلا هیچ کس جلو دار ما نیست این باور بکنی اینطوری شد که بیای چی شک گرفت بی خودی نبود و شما بعد از اونم ملاحظه بفرمایید که چطوری همه با هم باز دوباره همکاری میکردیم اگه خود جامعه باهایی با بیای چی همکاری نمیکرد ما میتونستیم کار بکنیم پس بیای چی اصلا متشکل از جامعه باهایی بود The internet changed BIHE's teaching system in the 1990s. Many classrooms were replaced by email, voice and video chat and other online teaching forums. That allowed many Baha'i and non-Baha'i academics around the world to teach BIHE students inside Iran. Any country that denies such a large sector of the population access to education is sacrificing a piece of its future for a short-term political expedient purpose. You know, it's really, it's funny because it's actually really vitalizing to be around people who are working for something without any compensation, for something that's so important that they really believe in. And, Um, that gives you a lot of energy and a lot of 
um, gives you a lot of momentum in your own life. I think it's really helped me outside my, outside just working on the curriculum, I feel the rest of my life has been enriched. I'm not a Baha'i, but I do believe that teaching at BIHE has certainly enhanced my personal experience, my personal life. I think it's made me a better teacher, not just for the people at, at, in, the, at, in, in BIHE, but for my students here. I'm here at McGill University, which is considered one of Canada's top university. And so I am working apparently with the best and the brightest. The only difference between the students at BIHE and my students are they don't have the opportunities. I sometimes wish the students I taught here understood how people are so thirsty to go to university and and I wish my students here understood that how lucky they are. The BIT students are particularly hungry for knowledge because they've had to face so many challenges in order to access that knowledge. They are very keen and very enthusiastic and very hardworking in um, obtaining that knowledge in learning and discussing and sort of trying to push their own boundaries of what they know. When you exclude people from education, you're, it's like you're cutting off part of one of your limbs. We had um, a student whose house was uh, ransacked and uh, they came in and sort of kind of interrogated them in the house and ransacked through the house, took materials that were BIHE materials. Um, we had another student whose family member was uh, taken in for questioning. Um, they didn't know whether what was going to happen. I've had a really enthusiastic, very bright student turn in straight A work um, in any school in the United States. People would have been very happy to have them have this individual there, the guy, you know, finished his degree at the BIHE and he's, um, you know, I mean, he was happy, but I was kind of upset that he was, you know, he was going to become a plumber's assistant. That, that, that's the level of opportunity that's available to him. The degrees given by BIHE in its nascent stage had no academic value. But in the mid-1990s, a number of universities around the world praised the academic value of BIHE and started to accept its graduates. Today, BIHE graduates study in more than 100 prominent universities around the world. ببینید ما فکر می‌کنیم BIHE نماید عشق به یاد گرفتن. یعنی بهترین تصویری هست که تو بتونی در دنیای امروز حتی بتونم بگم میتونم بگم در تاریخ دنیای آموزش آموزشی بی از این لحاظ که زیباترین تصویر رو از اینکه عشق به یاد گرفتن چه معنی داره و چه تأثیری میتونه داشته باشه در نهایت محرومیت نشون میده Many BIHE teachers are BIHE graduates. After Marjan Davudi was expelled from her university, she studied psychology at BIHE. She then moved to the United States, where she received her PhD from Indiana University. She is now a practicing psychologist in San Diego and a BIHE teacher. من یادم وقتی که به هر حال بیرون اومدم و رفتم مستقیم دانشگاه ایندیانا وقتی که رجیستریشن این خانوم گفت که خیلی خوب از فلان روز میتونی بری سر کلاس اسمت نوشته شد و دانشجوی رسمی ما هستی اینقدر ازش تشکر کردم که شک کرد اصلا 
چرا من دارم نکنه ریگی به کفشم به بقول معروف تقلبی کردم کاری چرا من اینقدر ازش تشکر باور نمی که شب تا صبح نخوابیدم برای اینکه صبح قرار بود سر کلاس بنشینم در حالی که 37 سالم بود یا این کتاب خونه رو وقتی درش باز شد و نگاه کردم و دیدم که الان من میتونم برم واقعا از کتاب خونه کتاب انتخاب کنم و بخونم یا کامپیوتر وجود داره که من بتونم بازش بکنم تازه شروع شده چیزایی که خیلی عادی و معمولیه برای ما مثل یک آرزوی بود که داره به حقیقت میپیونده کیوان رحیمیان و هز یونگر برادر کامران also graduated from BIHE. Kamran studied educational counseling in the University of Ottawa in Canada for four years, where he received his master's degree. In Canada, Kamran studied Marshall Rosenberg's non-violent communication process, which helps people to solve their conflicts peacefully. During his studies, Kamran visited his uncle Enayat in Phoenix. کامران وقتی که به امریکا اومد و من به کررات از اون خواهش کردم که امکان این که تو اینجا بمونی هست با سراحت لحجه و اعتقاد کامل معتقد بود که من باید به ایران برگردم و اون چه آموخته ام به دیگران بیاموزم و من این خدمت رو وظیفه وجدانی خودم میدونم و به هیچ وجه حاضر نیستم که اینجا بمونم و از مسئولیت وجدانی که دارم دور باشه. Kamran and Kavan's wives were also teachers at BIHE and organized non-violent communication workshops. Their decision to stay and teach in Iran came at a heavy price. Kavan wrote about this in a letter to his daughter Gina. I asked my wife Farishta if we have the right to make a decision for Gina and stay in Iran. We've made the choice and we are proud of it. But I fear Gina will question us about our decision in the future and ask, why did you make such a decision for me? Since the establishment of BIHE in 1987, the Iranian government has tried to shut it down through intimidations and arrests. News reports and films on Iran's state television portray BIHE as the Baha'i method of brainwashing innocent citizens and propagating prostitution and moral corruption. The accusations against the Baha'is are supported by Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. In a recent fatwa, he once again called the Baha'i faith a fake cult and banned his followers from any socializing with the Baha'is. Iranian government officials and diplomats claim that the Baha'is enjoy the same rights as other Iranian citizens. But the government turns a blind eye to harassment of the Baha'is. It calls the attacks spontaneous manifestation of anger by Muslims against infidels. This secret footage shows vandalized Baha'i properties, businesses and cemeteries in different cities in Iran by unknown assailants. <laughs> مرداشون رو توش دفت کنند ولی در تمام این سال ها هیچ کدوم از این محل ها از عذیت و آزار دوستان در امان نبود با زحمت بسیار و وسط بیابون اینجا با هزار سختی درخت کاشته بودن زحمت کشیدم و درخت رو بریدم و خدا میدونه که مرحله بعدی چیه کامران رحیمیان، his wife and several other BIHE administrators and teachers 
were arrested in September 2011. A number of charges were made against them, including endangering the security of the nation, promoting moral corruption, and espionage. Orwell couldn't have imagined this. If, if you told Orwell that there is a world in 21st century where people are going to be arrested because they are privately trying to organize a university online for their deprived students, and the regime is going to see this as a conspiracy, he would have thought, you're taking 1984 to exaggerated <laughs> limits. After Kamran's arrest, his brother Kayvan and his wife Fereshte became the guardians of Kamran's two-year-old son. At the time, Fereshte was fighting pancreatic cancer. She died a few months later. On his way to Evin prison, Kamran wrote a short letter to his son, Artin. My son, Artin, and the nation of Iran. I am happy with my achievements and what I've done for my country. The sound of the lashes which my father suffered in 1983 have since turned into musical rhythms that have accompanied my life since then. My father's suffering for six months in solitary confinement inspired me to learn and teach a new way of life and a peaceful way of communication to people. This has been the Rahimian family's gift to the Iranian nation. I wish you and our country a calm and happy life. شما میتونید کلاس رو از آدما بگیرید، مدرک رو از آدما بگیرید، استاد رو از آدما بگیرید، کامپیوتر رو مصادره بکنید یا حتی آدما رو توی زندان بندازید. ولی عشق به یاد گرفتن و به خدمت کردن و نه از اون دانشجوها میشه می می گرفت، نه از کسایی که با تمام عشق و وجودشون دارن کمکشون میکنن. Through educating their youth and non-violent resistance, the Baha'is of Iran have become an indelible part of the democratic movement. In 2009, when millions of Iranians took to the streets and demanded their votes to be recounted, the Islamic government blamed the demonstrations on the influence of the Baha'is and other seditious elements. Very few Baha'is were arrested during those protests, but the accusation that the Baha'is could provoke millions of Iranians was an implicit admission by the Islamic government that more than three decades of persecution has not defeated the Baha'is of Iran. In a symbolic gesture in 2013, Mohammad Nurizad, a radical Islamist turned reformist, visited Kamran Rahimian's son, Artin. He kissed Artin's feet and apologized for the hardship suffered by the Baha'is in the hands of a regime that he had supported in the past. A few months later, Mohammad Maliki, the first president of Tehran University after the revolution, visited the Rahimian family and said, I am a university professor. I am a Muslim and a Shia. I swear to God that studying is not a crime and no religious person should regard it as something illegal for anyone else. I think the Iranian democratic movement, uh, if it is to be worthy of its name, should not only fully defend the right of the Baha'is for full citizenship and full exercise of their faith, but they should also uh, begin a process of soul searching. Why is it that we were silent for so long? Unless you do that kind of a soul searching, uh, you're not going to get rid of the problem that caused it. A year after his brother's arrest, Kayvan received a call by Iranian intelligence agents. They told Kayvan that they would tell the court to give him an even harsher sentence than his brother. His crime? Teaching at BIHE. In a letter that went viral on the internet, Kayvan expressed opinions and sentiments shared by millions of Iranians, Baha'is and non-Baha'is. The phone rang. 
The intelligence agents asked, So your wife's dead, right? I answered, yes. We sentenced Kamran to four years in prison. We're going to sentence you to double that amount. I'm sorry and sad that in my country, instead of using the knowledge and experiences of people like me, we are accused of endangering the security of the nation. The Islamic Republic officials know better than I do that injustice will not last forever and that God Almighty will judge all of us by how just we have been in our lives. I, like my brother Kamran, repeat that I am happy with all the choices that I've made in my life. I hope the sufferings of my family can help the causes of freedom, justice, and progress in our country. Yeah. 